Olá pessoal, hoje nós vamos entrevistar a Karen Gertner, ela é a principal educadora do Art of Motion Training in Movement, é a fundadora do método Slings Myofascial Training, trabalha junto com Tom Myers no Anatomy Trains, eu a conheci recentemente num curso na Espanha e ela é uma pessoa que além de ser uma educadora inata, com uma super didática, tem muito conhecimento sobre o corpo, sobre o movimento. Então, hoje a gente vai falar um pouco sobre essa experiência dela, que vai muito além de, dos exercícios em si, e como ela também relaciona a, a fáscia no, nos movimentos atuais, na, no, nos nossos treinos, como é que a gente pode incorporar esse conceito do treinamento da face eh, no nosso dia a dia. Good morning, everybody. We are here today with Karen Gertner. She's from Anatomy Trains in Motion. And we are doing a quick interview with her. Uh, good morning, Karen. How are you? Excellent. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> nice to see you again. We're very happy to see you here. And we would like to share all the good things I experienced with you in Madrid. And so let's talk about anatomy trains. When we talk about uh, the meridians from anatomy trains, how do you integrate that in the movement, in motion? <laughs> so maybe first, it's, it's really worthwhile mentioning what everyone already knows when you recognize the holistic nature of the body it doesn't make things easier it, it makes them more complex because being human is complex so if you want to understand and skillfully work with or within a complex system it is helpful and for most of us it's actually necessary to have a structure and orientation aid so i'd like to make this this a little bit more um, tangible. So take, for example, the public transport system of London. So most of us would find it very difficult, maybe impossible, or at least very, very time consuming to make sense of a public transportation map that is an exact mirror of all the trains and buses and tube lines, the way they weave through the streets of London. Maps are stylized to assist the traveler to navigate the system successful. Now, when holding a map of London, it is still up to me if I want to take the fastest metro line or a bus route or with the most scenic view or find my own way on foot. In that sense, <laughs> and that's when the trains is, is a, a, a holistic body map and Tom, as the cartographer of anatomy trains, he has given us different teachers and therapists a, an incredibly useful and practically applicable map of the body to navigate its complexities with more clarity without being restrictive or exclusive. So, recognizing the anatomy trains myofascial meridians as guidelines can benefit us all because they are experience proven, so they work in practice as pathways to improve structural organization and, and movement functionality. At the same time, they leave us the freedom to utilize them the way we can incorporate in our practice. So a yoga teacher can use the anatomy trends body map to give the yoga teaching a different level of clarity. A Pilates teacher can add a new dimension to their teaching. A therapist can add new tools to their therapeutic um, <laughs> technique skill sets. Dancers personal trainers, everyone. So it's a, it's a very flexible or it's a very adaptable map that gives us more clarity in our teaching and moving basically on the way we, um, we treat without, and this I think is really important, without being exclusive. It still allows to blend in everything that has been working so far. 
And that's how I use it in movement. I use it as a tool. Okay. So mm. the, the good thing is that um, it, like a Pilates instructor, a yoga teacher, a personal trainer, anybody that works with movement can incorporate that in their practice, right? Exactly. And um, would you say that um, the meridians, when you when you start to incorporate that in your practice, our movements they become more natural, they are more functional. Mm. Yeah, yeah, completely. This, this is this is the beauty. It can be. In, in a in a, a movement class, which is guided movement, the um, Tom's body map is based on natural movement. These myofascial meridians develop because of the way we naturally move. So we can either use it directly to improve our natural or most functional movement patterns, and also apply it to structured movements that are maybe not as obviously you know a mirror of daily life but they will improve everyday functionality still because the map is based on our natural movement patterns so it's beautiful good so and from that uh i know you have your own method slings in motion mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about that how uh, did you create this method um how can we utilize that in our practice mm -hmm. so first i think it's important to say that the slings myofascial training is not so much a methodology it's i see it more of a concept that is compatible with other body-minded movement practices and therapies so the slings myofascial training essentially is a holistic movement concept with a correspondent education. The education also includes anatomy trainings in motion because the whole slings concept is based on Tom's um, body map. So the development has been, and that's really important to know, I think it has been an, an eight year plus development that is of the concept. The concept itself, it's experience proven, so it works in practice, it is science informed, therefore constantly in progress. It is resource oriented rather than illness focused, which is important to know too. And I find this really important for myself too. It's we are ignorance conscious, otherwise we're blind <laughs> to the to the obvious and really there would be no progress. And then the, the overarching aims of science essentially are structural integration through movement, which encompasses kinesthetic intelligence, therefore postural ease and movement freedom, vitality, therefore somatic resourcefulness, resilience, which includes adaptability and self-healing. And then what we call manana competence, being present and the ability to rejuvenate and love for movement because essentially this is the best health um, preservation. So this is really important for me to say as well, all of this may sound quite good and it almost sounds like the words are good, too good to be true. And sometimes when something sounds really good, really are, are these just marketing words so it's really important for me to say they are not in things we don't use empty words every word every expression has meaning and it has a traceable story therefore it has taken so long to develop it and i've written over a thousand pages to explain why do we do what we do and how do we achieve these big lifelong goals i just mentioned so it's it's comprehensive yet it's practical and i think it's it's also um, it's presented in a digestible manner but we have the goals hopefully it's short-term value so this is this is things in a in a nutshell okay and um i noticed in your training that um, besides being very 
um, word and conscious about movement. You are very careful with the words that you say, with the with the with the guidance of the class, how you put the words, how you explain the exercise, the way you want us to feel the exercise in our body. And I thought it, that it was very helpful and very different because sometimes we get to know a methodology and they are not very careful with that. And that makes a big difference. Uh, like in, with, like I'm a physical therapist and treating patients, I noticed when we therapy towards the healthy part of it, not focusing only on pain, focusing on health, the patient gets better quicker. What is your experience with this? Like with the words, with the, the self-awareness, all of this input that you um, showed us during your training? Oh, yes. And I completely agree. Often words are very, very powerful because they contribute how your beliefs shape and how you receive a message. And fascia is our, it's a large sensory system and it's our most influential perceptual system in the body. So as much as it's important to um, know the properties of fascia, use them consciously in movement, I think a big part is what you just said, it's how do we deliver the message to the clients? Do we make it uh, illness focused, for example? Um, you know, from here you will get better or do we strengthen the resources someone has? So they are approaching challenge from a place of strength, which is a very different approach, aiming for the same thing, but from from a different place. And yeah, I think it's hugely important, especially when you're working with fascia. Fascia is a medium to create challenge in a, in a very positive and powerful way. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. I want to say what you just pointed out before. Sometimes in the, the world of fashion training, the, the word, maybe everywhere, but the words are used maybe a little bit too, um, <laughs> too generous. It's, it's a little bit big words with very little behind it. Now the words would be right, but in the context of what right to be also be careful what you say. So you can really back up the story because we have smart clients, they ask questions, I want to give them an answer or yeah. Yeah. Okay. And nowadays we are um listening a lot about fascia and like how fascia works with muscle they work together right now um, in your experience why do you think it is so important to work with fascia nowadays because this has been neglected for a long time but now everybody's concerned about and aware about this so um how do you think that why do you think that's so important to work with fascia nowadays Mm, maybe uh, let me divide it. I think A, it's so important to work with fascia because fascia is, is the tissue that helps us embryologically. Together with blood, fascia is the first system in the body, and in this system, every other system develops. So it really is the, you know, the, an original substance in our body. Um, and it's all connecting network, so it, it's hugely important. And I want to say two things. A, I really think in working with fascia is incredibly important. It gives us new solutions and a new way to train in a better way. But it doesn't mean that other things become unimportant. Sometimes I get a little bit the sense of like, muscles are not important anymore. It's like oh they are more important than ever but in a new context then of course with the nervous system the endocrine system doesn't matter so it's about including and integrating more consciously rather than excluding and the other thing is this because you said it before every movement is special muscles and fascia cannot be separated in movement but it's very easy to think when you're thinking about muscle, training muscles consciously. 
So a bodybuilder trains muscles differently than a ballet dancer. If you want to train core stabilization, you're training very differently than when you prepare for a marathon. We all understand it very clearly. If I want to train my muscles in a certain way, I need to understand the properties of muscles and um, then set a clear goal, what do I want to achieve, and then a training strategy to achieve my goal considering the properties of fascia. And I truly believe that when it comes to conscious fascia training or fascia focused training, we need to do the same thing. We need to understand the properties of fascia, which are different to the properties of muscles. And that's a whole, you know, <laughs> kind of field of study in itself. And then formulate the goals accordingly to the properties of fascia, not to the bite, but to train with clear intention, move with clear intention, teach with clear intention, achieve more efficiency. And it sounds a little paradox, but I've seen it work in practice. When emphasizing the properties of fascia, focus on the movement, the interplay between systems is so much better. So interplay between the muscular and the fascial system, the nervous system and the fascial system. So I believe in, we call it differentiated integration. We differentiate to integrate better. So have I answered your question, Anna? Yes, yeah, sure. Yes. <laughs> and um, how do you foresee the field of exercise? Because we know we came a long, uh, long, a long way. Things have changed. Like biomechanics, the concept of biomechanics has shifted to tensegrity, and things are changing nowadays. We are talking about fascia, meridians. How do you foresee the the future for this market? <laughs> you know what? I just revised one of my slings books and I left a 12th chapter and it's completely empty. <laughs> 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 it's, it's the imponderable, it's the things we can't foresee. I think there will be a big shift. Um, right now it's slow adaptation, but I, think I, I can't actually foresee where it's taking us. Because every time I'm, even now, I'm, I'm working, I'm teaching, it's like, wow, new doors are opening up that change our perspective on how we treat the body, how we work. I can't even tell you except that I think we will collaborate more because what I think what I see is we need we need the, not only the you know get away from dualism and go like everything is separate and muscles are separate from this and practitioners are separate I think it's, it's it will bring us closer to collaboration between different um, professionals and also really start to understand the body more as a different, as an integrated, I'm sorry, as in an integrated organism and then understanding a part really does not explain the working of the whole, but where it's going, I don't know, but I see it's going in a good way that's integrating us rather than separating us. Mm -hmm. um, you touch a very important point. Uh, I, I remember something that um, really caught my attention in your training was first, one of the first um, words that you saw, said was, my training is inclusive. Now mm -hmm. we, we want to include this in your practice. We're not excluding anything that you already know. And again, you're saying this, it's something inclusive. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and for us as a professional to collaborate, to include, uh, we need some some skills like we need to be to have an open mind, right? Mm -hmm. What other things do you think we need as a professional in order to really collaborate in this field? I think. In, in the words of movement, in the words of movement, we need to, and I think that really happening, elevate the standard. Sometimes 
movement teaching is trivialized and it shouldn't be. However, we need to lift the standard uh, because expectations arise not just from our clients, but also from our um, allied health professionals, from our colleagues. So, in movement, I think this is a definite need. We need to increase our knowledge gradually as we do. And then, from the world of therapy and also medicine, I think there, there, there needs to be maybe, I'm saying it very bluntly. Uh, a real appreciation for movement as the most powerful medicine there is at the moment. And that is scientifically proven. There is no medication, like substance medication, that is as effective as, as movement with such little side effects. So while the movement world is, you know, adding skills and knowledge. I think therapists and also medical professionals need to um, give appreciation to movement teachers so we can truly meet at, at eye level, which it should be, which is professionals in, in different fields, really. Yeah. That's so true. yeah, so appreciation and recognition, basically, of, of each other's unique skill sets. Good. Okay, uh, our interview is coming to an end. We really would like to bring you to Brazil next year. Would love to. <laughs> I really want everybody to get to know your your work, your training. It was really I had a really good experience with you in Madrid. Thank you. So we're gonna work hard for to bring you to Brazil next year. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you so much for your time, for being here with us today. And Thank I really hope to see you again soon. We will. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>